Welcome back. I am going to try to cover both chapter 7 and 8, so hold on. It's going to be a longer lecture. Um, uh, although, to be fair, I think chapter 7 goes into a lot more of the details of theater spaces and navigating stages and things that, while I admire their ambition of covering all that, we're going to sort of just hit the highlights, um, do the edited version. So the first term we have here in looking at theater spaces, and we're in chapter 7, is um, looking at the proscenium. Uh, some people say proscenium, proscenium, either pronunciation is fine. This is the Moscow Art Theater, and you can see almost like you're looking through a picture frame into the box, um, into the stage, and the curtain is closed, but you can imagine when the curtain opens. This is the traditional opera style theater. Um, you can see the box seating on the side, um, and uh, most of us, when we think of going to the theater, Andrew Jackson stage at TPAC, um, you're going to imagine this this proscenium opera house style theater. And there are many advantages, which we'll get into today, um, including, most importantly, a fly system, our way of um, quickly bringing scenery from above the stage down to the stage very quickly. Uh, and that's very useful in making transitions go uh, swiftly. Uh, the arena theater it has an audience on all sides. So um, some of you may be familiar with basketball arenas. This is Arena Stage in Dallas, very famous. I did Southern Arena Theater. It's a different uh, kind of theater, and there are usually less production elements. You know, you can't have a whole bunch of scenery when you have to have people seeing from every side. Um, Southern Arena Theater, the one that I did, it took a lot of getting used to because I was used to the proscenium. I was used to cheating out and projecting. And arena theater really became popular in the 60s and 70s when we started to have more immersive experiences. Audiences looking at us from all sides, feeling like they're in the room where it's happening, to quote ha Hamilton. Um, you might also hear this uh, as theater in the round. So you can think of this one as a basketball arena. Audience on all four sides. Thrust. I watched this uh, comedian named Miranda and she has these favorite words and one of her favorite words is thrust. And uh, uh, just funny to me. But anyway, I can't help but say it that way. Thrust. So a stage scene, um, a space when it thrusts in the audience. So you're covered by three of the four sides. And um, this helps you feel like you're out among the audience, but you still get the luxury of some of those um, magic of theater. You know, I can still have the deus ex machina. This is the theater of Delphi. Wouldn't you love to be there today? Let's just take a field trip. Uh, the deus ex machina, you know, had that machine crane bring the actor over if they're playing the god of the machine over that wall. You still can have scenery. Uh, so some of the benefits of a... a um, arena stage and obviously these are the oldest kinds of known theater in the western world. Japanese theater is also um, interesting, interestingly enough a thrust theater which is also a very ancient style of theater. So um, the no theater is also performed in the thrust so it makes me think that uh, this was a, the popular way to do it there for a while. And remember we said ancient Grecian theater started uh, with the threshing floor with uh, the separation of wheat so there was that circular pattern of moving in a circle that was very organic to the original performances which is part of the reason for that original shape but you can have a thrust in an indoor space as well any of these can be although proscenium really can't be an outdoor uh, but um, it's on three sides you can think of a model walking down a runway right they walk on that runway they come to the end of the runway they are you know, almost surrounded by the audience, but they come back to the back of the runway and they can slip behind the partition wall. So a thrust, just as a model, walks down a runway. A thrust stage provides a playing area closer to the audience and more farther away. So uh, we don't talk about traverse in this textbook, so you can just ignore that one, but hopefully this little diagram helps clarify proscenium thrust and arena staging. And so Using these different kinds of stages has different implications, right? Arena, a theater in the round, we're going to expect a more naturalistic acting style. Uh, if we go to proscenium, it's probably going to be more theatrical, thrust somewhere in between. 
So I have a picture here of MTSU's black box theater. A black box is flexible. It's adaptable. You see those chairs stacked up on the side there. You can arrange the chairs however you like. Um, and every different production, you can use it creatively, right? Um, you can have um, actors enter from any corner of the room. A lot of, if you go to off-Broadway, you'll see black box theaters because they're cheap. And um, also they kind of suit well to experimental works. So if you're doing something different, something that, you know, if I have a touring Broadway th show, I've got scenery, I've got costumes, I've got everything sort of plotted out. But if you're doing something kind of weird and new and different, um, a black box is well suited to that. So if you know about yourself that you don't really like the kind of theater that's offbeat, maybe you're, you're like more commercial things, then I would look at the venue and say, okay, is this a black box theater or is it a big Broadway style theater? And that'll kind of give you an indication of what kind of work to expect from, from that production. Not always, but it's usually a pretty good rule of thumb. And if you go to off-Broadway, you'll go to theaters where there are poles in the middle of the theater. You'll go to theaters that are the size of somebody's living room, may even be a transformed living room. Uh, people will perform anyway, anywhere to get noticed and to, to get an agent and to get a leg up. Um, it's also worth mentioning here that there are a lot of great uh, transformed spaces. From what I understand, there's a church in McMinnville that's being used as a theater. I haven't been there yet, but uh, you can use just about anywhere. You can perform in front of the Notre Dame, as many mimes do, for money. You know, found spaces. You don't necessarily need a, a space to perform theater. So, in the staging of a lot of Western-style shows, we have the imitation of a fourth wall, the convention of a fourth wall, which is to say with realism, with naturalism, the audience is not going to make direct eye contact with the performer. I had a dance teacher who, if you wanted to get in trouble with her, man, peek out the curtain uh, and make direct eye contact with the audience. She just thought that was the worst thing in the world. Um, and a lot of that traditional staging from, say, the 19th century up until the 1960s had this convention of the fourth wall, that the audience was just creepy looking in on our story, almost like watching a television screen. A lot of Shakespeare's sort of soliloquies were meant to be performed directly to the audience. And of course, more experimental works played with breaking that fourth wall, breaking the convention of looking directly into the audience. With groups like the Blue Man Group, the performer goes out into the audience and gets among the people, really breaking that fourth wall and breaking it good. So how does the audience relate to this performer on stage often relates to what kind of theater space you're working in. The smaller the house, the more intimate, the more relatable often that you have a relationship with the performer. And remember, if you can see them, they can see you. That's one of the responsibilities of an audience member is to say, okay, this person is giving a soliloquy right now to me. I need to send good energy back to them. I need to be attentive. I need to follow along um, because they can see you too, <laughs> which is weird for us in a television age where we're used to looking at a screen. So, all right. So now we're going to skip 30 pages. <laughs> Uh, there's just no way I can cover every single thing in this textbook, I promise. Uh, I would if I could, but I can't, so I won't. So there is baby Emily at a sewing machine. Um, I consider myself a craftsperson, and I enjoy design. Um, and so we're going to talk about these elements of design. He frames them as scenic design, but I would argue that these elements are just basic production elements of every um, of every different kind of theater, including costuming. So. so the first element of scenic design is line, lines. So when you're looking at the basic overview of what you want, you say, what are the shapes or the lines that I'm seeing here, right? And so one way that I always relate this to the audience, to my students is, okay, what about jeans? 
you know, what shape of jeans do you want? If I go to Old Navy today, I can get bell bottoms, I can get straight leg, I can get skinny jeans. I mean, they all have a different silhouette. And that's kind of fashion wise what I'm interested in. The same thing can be true of a set design. Do I see a lot of angles and sharp edges or do I see more rounded flowing lines, right? Julie Taymor talked about this in that video that you watched when she talked about the ideograph and she directed Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, which is why you're seeing that terrifying villain there. Um, so the ideograph, there it is, <laughs> I knew it was in there somewhere. As a designer, if you can come up with some central shapes, some very simplistic central shapes for you as the designer, then it can help motivate you um, to give the overarching shapes, the dominant shapes of your set design or your costume design, uh, to have those certain feel to them. You know, what do what are my curtains? Well, maybe they're water curtains. And, and then how does that relate to a chair? Well, maybe it has the same shape and flow of water. So when you kind of get those central images, it helps unify and match overall the production elements. Um, and of course, if you're picking out a prom dress, we have bell-shaped dresses, we have mermaid dresses. So the different shapes relate to different eras and they also relate to the personality. So this is uh, Glinda the Good Witch in The Wizard of Oz and she floats in in a bubble and they, the costume designer refers to this as the bubble dress and it just sort of feels like a bubble right? The fabric is flowy, it's light, you imagine it moves in and floats around the stage and uh, this is in the Elizabethan time and this is a um, Victoria's wedding dress which I had the honor of seeing in uh, the museum in London when I was there and you can see the same shapes that happened at the Wizard of Oz were happening in Victorian England even though Oz is an imaginary place it still is rooted in a sense of time. And that can often be helpful, you know, finding images from the historical period, not just recreations of those images, but really finding those historical documents that have original costumes or original furniture. And uh, that can serve as a huge source of information and in getting the right lines to depict an era. Second one is mass. And that has to do with the weight of things, the weight. Right, so there we have Waiting for Godot. We have that simple little tree on a bare stage. And that helps sort of depict the emptiness of this absurd play and the desolate feeling of the play, right? It, it demonstrates something psychological to the audience through this basic design principle. Composition is the balance of elements, right? Composition is the balance. So if I'm doing a play, like a classical play, as I said, Phaedra, a lot of these Shakespeare plays were neoclassical. They were very interested in symmetry. They're speaking and rhyming couplets. Their language is symmetrical, is matching, is rhyming. They like the order. But if I'm doing something more modern, I'm probably going to do something more symmetrical. Symmetry can be boring, right? It's classical beauty. It's what we expect for things if they're going to look, quote, nice. But then sometimes you want to create something ugly, right? Which can always be hard for actors for us to know. We're about to costume something and make you look ugly. They don't, they don't necessarily like that. But our job is to tell the story, right? Not to please the actors. So, um, so in Wicked, um, the townspeople costumes to me could be a museum in and of themselves. They are beautifully asymmetrical and uh, if you're not familiar with Wicked, it's the precursor to the Wizard of Oz. They're telling the backstory to the Wizard of Oz um, before how the Wicked Witch of the West and uh, Glinda know each other before Dorothy even shows up. So you can see these townspeople are delightfully odd. They're asymmetrical. They have one sleeve of one kind and a different sleeve of a different kind. Most of us, if you look down at your costume right now, your outfit that you chose to wear today, most of you are going to be symmetrical because that's standard beauty. But remember if we're trying to tell a story and it's in this wonky fantasy land, then we really get to play with asymmetry. 
The Wizard, on the other hand, this is from The Wiz Live, um, which aired on NBC. You can see the wizard is this dominant force. He or she, uh, she is played by Queen Latifah here, is this power structure. So you can see the symmetrical, she almost feels like a column of strength, right? And her, she's got lots of mass there and her symmetry is depicted um, in a way that's very classical, right? So the fourth element of design is texture. Texture. So when I worked at Hattiesburg High School, I directed the, uh, I costumed, sorry, not directed, the Wiz. And one thing I felt very strongly with is the lion having that lion-like texture. So the Wiz has a family-friendly feel. It's a show that people of all ages can enjoy. And even though I had a plus size performer and it was going to have to special order that lion suit, it was worth every penny. Um, because to watch little kids come up after the show and give him a big hug and pet him uh, was just priceless. And so when we're looking at certain characters, giving them a texture, um, a surface feel can be really important in selling the whole picture. The Tin Man, you can see we didn't have the money or the energy to give him a suit of armor. So he's just wearing a lame, but it still shines like, like metal would, right? So catching in on that texture gives you variety that can be important. You can see in the backdrop there, um, our set designer covered the wizard's gate in glitter. And the texture of that uh, was glittery and gave a sense of spectacular to it, right? If you're doing a show like Piano Lesson, then we have more rugged textures. We have gritty realism. And so maybe those textures feel more worn and dirty and slick with age. So if you're doing musical theater, often the texture is razzle-dazzle, glitter, glam, glitz. The fifth element of design is color. Now color is so complex and over in the bottom left hand corner you can see some of these meanings but those are different from country to country, from person to person. Um, you know, what's your favorite color? I could go around, you know, the proverbial classroom and each of you would probably have something different to say. Um, for the record, mine is blue. <laughs> um, and so when you're looking at what colors to put together, uh, it can sometimes be helpful to move just right across the color wheel. The color wheel is a very useful tool. If you're an athlete and you have a team, you can often find that they're right across the wheel from each other, right? Purple and yellow is my husband's favorite athletic team, LSU. And, uh, you know, those are contrasting colors, right? Uh, those are right across from each other on the color wheel. Um, or I guess I use the word contrasting. This chart used the words complementary. So red and green, we have that association with Christmas. But when I was in China, red and green was everywhere together. They didn't think twice about it, right? We have uh, associations. If we see a woman come in in a red dress in our culture, um, then maybe that means that she's a little bit on uh, the trashy side. Everybody has their different color associations depending on their faith. And in, in Asian culture, um, particularly as it pertains to theater, the colors have deep meaning um, that are traditions passed on. And if you see someone come in in that color, you know, okay, that person's a hero, especially if it's on their face in a makeup form, um, easily identifiable. So usually um, it's good to kind of limit your color scheme in some way and say, okay, this show, like you saw for Crybaby, I saw a lot of red and black. And that was sort of where I um, focused in the color wheel. Um, you know, it's not unusual for a show like Importance of Being Earnest for the whole show to be in pastel tones, Pride and Prejudice, whole show to have pastels, because that was the color that was popular in the fashion of that time. So, um, Color combinations can have psychological implications. The color wheel can be a huge tool for you when you're trying to find colors that go well together, whether it be those triadic colors, the complementary colors, or even the analogous colors, the colors that are right next to each other on the color wheel. So 
Hopefully that's useful if you've never heard that before. Hopefully you've, you've been in art classes before and this is a review. So <laughs> this is uh, Snow White was a show, a children's show that I did a few years ago. And Snow White to me is one of those quintessential like classic story tales. So I picked that triad, red, yellow, royal blue, and I, you know, that's Snow White's little house where she finds her dwarfs, and that's in that Disney dress that um, I bought right off the rack, I will shamelessly say. And even in the, in the set dressing, in those flowers, um, having a limited color palette for such a kitschy show really helped draw it together and have a sense of continuity. Uh, for the character matching the set, matching the overall feel that we have in children's shows of them being bright and colorful and happy. Obviously, if I'm doing an absurdist play, you saw that picture of Waiting for God, though. It's in black and white tones, darker, more, um, you know, sincere. Uh, so every show, often when you go into those initial design meetings with your director, you want to ask them, what colors do we see? What colors do we not want to see? And that is instrumental. All right, moving right along. Maybe this won't be a long lecture. I said that. Moving right along to the next page, we're looking at specifically now scenic design. What are the tools of the trade when it comes to scenic design? One of the first things you want to draw up as a scenic designer is a ground plan. If you buy a play from the last I don't know, 40 years, um, you can often flip to the back and see, I was looking to see, I have piano lesson here beside me. No, I'm not seeing one. But sometimes they'll have in the back of the play script a ground plan for you to see. It's important for staging. The director will need something like this for their blocking to say, how many people can I fit on that couch? And this is really early on in the process. And you know, nowadays it's often drawn up on AutoCAD. It's no longer a handmade thing. Um, it's often something that um, is digitally produced. Uh, but you, it helps the director know the staging of it. It helps the scenic designer. That ground plan sometimes moves into a model form, uh, 3D, small to scale, usually quarter inch scale, where you make a mini version of the set so that the actors can visualize it so that the director can um, use it and you know negotiating how many actors they can fit in the space. So just as an architect draws up a blueprint, a scenic designer draws up a ground plan. All right, so when we get into set building, we have materials and machinery that we use to help um, tell the story, and we're on page 197. The turntable. The turntable is a circle on the floor which rotates. In Les Mis, if you've ever seen a live version of Les Miserables, the villagers are marching in place, but the whole time the turntable is moving and so even though it looks like they're um, they're not moving the turntable is moving and they're marching in place almost like a treadmill and uh, do you hear the people sing singing the song of angry men and it's got to have that feel of like ah uh, which really helps with the turntable but some theaters um, will will stick a platform right in the middle of that turntable and it's a quick way for them to change scenes so on one side of the flat in the middle, you'll see one scene and then they'll flip that turntable around real quick, sometimes with a rope, often with a pneumatic tool. If you're familiar with hardware and tools, uh, pneumatic is air formed. Um, sometimes it's electric. Uh, turntables change the scenery quickly if you're using them to change scenery, which can be super helpful. Um, I've seen it seems like every time I see a show at uh, Cannon County, they often use turntables with something on one side and something on the other, which works well for their thrust space. So because they have a thrust, they can't put the uh, fly system in and fly in scenery the way that I can at Motlow. So a turntable is a quick way for them to change the scenery, um, and it seems to be a device that's working well for them. Turntables aren't super cheap, so that's why we don't use one at Motlow. That is Motlow's Fly Loft. If you are like me and have a fear of heights, this picture probably turns your stomach. Um, 
I did not take this picture, although I have been up uh, to the top to work on the flies, and um, there's a railing, and every time I have to climb it, I just have to say a little prayer. Um, so the fly system was developed by sailors, and the sailors in London and on the coast in, in uh in the Americas too, uh, sailors, you know, obviously used these complex knots. They were used to rigging to fly sails in and out. And so when sailors designed scenic elements, um, they used the same techniques they knew from sailing. And so those battens, those long metal bars that are hanging there, or if you're talking to the master electrician, he's probably going to call them electrics because that's what he thinks of them as. You can see they've got a series of plugs up there, um, not altogether undifferent from the uh, you know, plug you have on your wall to plug your uh, cell phone into. So those different electrics are where we you know, see different uh, lights. So one batten, that first batten is the uh, proscenium curtain, the grand curtain, the big red curtain. And then right behind it you can see what's called a teaser, which is just a short little black curtain that hides those lights. Now if you go to a rock style concert, something um, like Tommy, then they're probably not going to cover the lights. They want you to see the lights. That's part of the rock star aesthetic. But traditional theater usually uses teasers to hide the lighting instrument so it's not distracting. And then the next baton has a series of lighting instruments on it. And then the next has a scenic drop, which we'll talk about in, in just a minute. Um, these fly systems can be very dangerous, especially in an older theater. If you have rigging that hasn't been adjusted in a while, um, it's on a series of weights and pulleys. You may have been exposed to a classical detective story where somebody, a sandbag, falls on them. That's because of a fly system. Uh, recently in New York City, a baton dropped and uh, concussed a lot of scenic workers, uh, stagehands, and um, it was uh, very sad and very scary. They had to stop the show and uh, get the medics in and take them to the emergency room. They all lived, but uh, those battens are very heavy. Um, it wasn't uncommon for us to clear the set, to have everybody go out into the lobby in order to adjust uh, the weighting system on this, because if one falls, it boom shakalaka, as my mother would say, it can really uh, shake the ground. So if you're in a theater and you hear the word heads, that means cover your head. Don't look up means cover your head because something's falling from the rafters, that something's falling from the fly loft, whether it be a batten or a lighting instrument or just a gel. Um, hopefully, we're going to speak that. It's just a gel. But I will never have a career in lighting or, uh, you know, because I, mm, I'm scared of heights. Whew, scary stuff staring at that fly loft. So another tool of the trade is a flat. A flat is a glorified picture frame. You got a wooden frame there and you stretch muslin or canvas across a, the cheapest cotton fabric you can find. Then you treat that fabric uh, just as you would a picture, a canvas frame. This is the most common form of unit sets where you put them all together and then they have those braces. I don't think you've really been in, in theater long if you've never tripped over or stubbed your toe on one of those braces. Uh, they can be very painful in the dark, um, but you have a toggle there in the middle because sometimes the uh, the flats are carried by performers on and off stage, stagehands on and off stage, and uh, we at Motlow, as I record this, we often uh, use insulation foam instead of creating flats. Um, it is very breakable. It, it is not sturdy at all. I've had an actor put their hand through the foam. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, that's embarrassing. But we work on a restricted budget. So all that lumber to create flats, even though you can use them over and over again, uh, can still be time consuming and costly. So as I record this, we're using a lot of foam. Write your, you know, administrators at Motlow, tell them we need more money in the theater. We'll start using more flats. But a scrim, a scrim. This is something often when people write their critique, they're trying to find the word for this and they can't think of it. So um, 
make sure that you keep this starred in your notes so that people can come back. It's a thin open weave fabric. So you see she in the foreground is not standing behind the scrim, but those guys on the platforms in those four different kind of picture frames, they're in what's behind a scrim. A scrim can make it feel like a memory. It can make it feel, uh, help soften the focus. So she in the foreground is, um, is the focus and they in the background feel more like a memory, feel more like a blurry sort of uh, afterthought. So you can see when they just light it from the front, this is the exact same picture, right? Just when one is lit from the front, those are opaque, you can't see through them. And then when you lit from the back, you can see those actors. The other thing scrims do is they uh, allow for quick storytelling, right? People are there, people aren't there. I mean, you got it. People are there, people aren't there. And so uh, scrims are sometimes, especially in Broadway shows, the first image will be a scrim. I'm thinking of Wicked, there's this big beautiful scrim on a map. Or when I went to go see Hello Dolly, there was a big beautiful articulated scrim. And then they backlight it and you get to watch the townspeople walk through. And that's sort of a common trope. Through this transparency, through a soft focus that feels old timey and sort of um, poetic. Once again, scrims are expensive. We don't have one at Motlow. I certainly would like for us to get one, write your administrator. If you ever meet the president, currently President Torrance, make sure and say, Miss Seal really wants a scrim. <laughs> and he will roll his eyes. So, um, a rendering. So any designer, scenic, costume, uh, they're gonna create a rendering, props artists. Uh, and that is a hand drawing. And this is, um, the Nashville Rep, which we went and saw at the Tennessee Performing Arts Center. This is one of my favorite sets I have ever seen. It was delightfully intricate and um, negotiated. And often this is the initial design meeting. The designer comes in with their renderings to be approved and to help communicate with the director. They're a means to an end. They're not something in and of themselves that often get celebrated. Um, they are one stepping stone towards something more. Um, although I think this drawing, I would hang it on my wall. I just think it's beautiful. I did have the pleasure of seeing this and because it was such an intricate unit set, um, you can see that they had to get kind of creative with their staging. This is cell block tango and uh, they're just holding frames rather than having a whole jail depicted on stage but you can see that tri-cut the way that the light comes through those absolutely stunning and that light up back uh, Chicago sign was also when it lit up just absolutely stunning so uh, here we have some famous art deco this is the lobby of the frist if you've never been to the art uh, gallery in Nashville the frist I highly recommend it it is beautiful I feel like I'm in the Wizard of Oz every time I'm in there um, it is just gorgeous so you can see those same shapes in the Chicago set so it's homage to the period but speaking of mass this really feels cluttered and heavy which I think is good and right for a show like Chicago right um, dealing with themes of um, fame and it feels sort of chaotic at times the mass of this set is, is pretty compelling and uh, there's a rehearsal that I found online you can see the technical director has his monitors in there adjusting the lights and stuff um, and once again this is at TPAC but downstairs in the Jackson stage or maybe it's the Johnson stage one of those presidents um, but it was a wonderful performance of Chicago and I just was mesmerized by the set. I kept getting lost um, in it. And you can also see the glitz and colors. It was made out of gold and so it really popped. Um, you can't always tell in the dark or when it's recessed or lit differently. And this is before they got the Chicago sign up but it is just fantastic. So wow, this really did not end up being that long of a lecture. <laughs> um, when I sat and looked at all the content I had to cover, but it was sort of just, these are all the words that you need to know in order to understand the nature of um, scenic design. These are the tools of the trade. These are the art concepts. 
So as always, all the world's a stage. When you pick out your tie to match your shirt, I hope you consider that color wheel. Um, when you are designing your living room, uh, think about mass, think about shapes, think about the way you want the space to make you feel, right? Um, if you're telling a creepy story, then you include that creepy stuff. Um, you think about when you're designing your home and I know this is coming from a place of privilege and assuming that you have the money to uh, HGTV your life um, but you know your office at work is it cluttered is it full of crap that makes you anxious uh, you know sweep it out bring in a picture of the ocean that helps you center yourself um, think about how the art around you makes you feel and uh, be the scenic designer for your own life. I know, gag me with a spoon, I'm so cheesy. But, um, you know, it's not a dress rehearsal, it's real life. And I hope you're enjoying it. As always, thank you for listening.